Welcome back to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Okay, what do these names have in common? Scott Peterson, Michael Jackson, Chris Brown, Winona Ryder, the Menendez brothers. They have all been represented by today's incredible guest, the esteemed criminal defense attorney, Mark Garagos. As a fan of true crime, I've been fascinated by Mark and all the people he represents for a very long time. What drives someone to defend people that for all intents and purposes appears guilty? How does he manage such high profile cases and doesn't seem to really break a sweat? How important is the court of public opinion? Mark answers all of that and much more. He gives us his thoughts on the Alex Murdoch trial, uh, the fact that he is asking for a new retrial. He talks evidence in the Brian Koberger case with the Idaho murders. And we get an update on his fight to help free Lyle and Eric Menendez. He is an encyclopedia of knowledge, and I had the best time chatting with him. So I only had 30 minutes. Clearly, this man is very busy. And um, as you may be following this reality reckoning story, he is the lawyer that Bethany Frankel hired to contact NBC. Um, So his name has been heavily brought into entertainment news because of that. And so obviously this guy could talk forever on a myriad of subjects. Um, I really hope that you enjoy this episode. Get a glass of wine, sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Mark Garagos. Mark Garagos, thank you for joining me on Misunderstood. It's such an honor. I've always wanted to meet you in person, so thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I haven't uh, spoken to you before, so this is a great thing. I love yeah. it. Um, I love it too. So, all right, I want to know from the beginning, did you experience something in your childhood that made you feel like you had more empathy for somebody that may be a criminal um, and you wanted to deal with somebody that was facing criminal charges rather than prosecuting them? You want to know the truth? I'll give you the truth. So my father, when I was growing up uh, from ages, from when I was born to when I was about 14 years old, was a hard charging DA prosecutor in the county of Los Angeles. And I used to follow him around. And I, I thought this was the greatest. I would watch the old TV show, Perry Mason. I kind of identified one day I, I went to, during summer vacation and I watched him. He was prosecuting a case over in Glendale, California. And it was, the defendant was a kid who wasn't that much older than me. I mean, obviously he was in adult court, maybe 18 years old. And my father as the DA was asking that this kid go to state prison for, for 18 months for being in a place where marijuana was smoked. And I not even smoking it, not possessing it, just being in a place where marijuana was smoked. That blew me away. I remember sitting in the car with him afterwards saying, how in the heck could you do that? How could you ruin this kid's life? And shortly thereafter, my dad retired from the DA's office and went into private practice. And I joined him maybe 10 years later. I will tell you the follow up, though, Rachel, to that story is at his memorial service many years later, and I was telling that same story. My mother afterwards came up to me and says, oh, that's so cute that you think you talked him out of the DA's office. And I said, well, I thought I did. And I practiced with him for 20 years. And she said, no, no, no. He was making 17 grand a year. I had three boys, including you. And if you thought I was going to pay for college on 17 grand a year, you're out of your mind. So uh, just goes to show you. But yeah, yes, that was that was the pivotal moment for me, at least. That is a great story. So why in general um, and how does a criminal defense lawyer stand up for the rights of someone who clearly seems guilty? I mean, you're talking about uh, a a story that's a lot lesser than some of the people you represent. I've had a number of cases. One I can think of uh, right off the top of my head because it was so jarring to me. I've had cases where people have been charged with special circumstance. Special circumstances that not only is it a murder case, but the prosecutor also says either you were lying in wait, it was for financial motive, it was more than one killing. I've had people who I 
believed were innocent. I can mm-hmm. think of one case in particular. Now, if I had, if I was judging that person, I would have said, well, the evidence looks overwhelming. For instance, in that case, a, the mother of the victim identified my guy, uh, said absolutely it was him. Guess what? Six months later, we had done a parallel investigation. DNA from a hat that the perp had left behind exonerated my guy, and we identified who it really was. But not before the prosecutor had screwed up their case by having the mother positively identify my guy as the culprit, which meant that they couldn't prosecute who really did it. I can give you story after story about that. I mean, one of the things that's been great about the Innocence Project is the number of people who were on death row who had Mm -hmm. been falsely identified that DNA later after the fact came along and exonerated. So it's not my job to be the judge and the jury. It's my job to hold the prosecution accountable and make sure that they do their job. Otherwise, we're in a system that is irretrievably broken. By the way, our system may be irretrievably broken. Right, right. Very true. Um, Is there a case that you wouldn't take? I've turned down cases. I won't mention who they are, but I've had cases, um, and fairly recently, where I have not taken the case. I may like the, I may have known the person for many years and felt uncomfortable doing it. Uh, I can think of a couple of, uh, you know, household names that have come to me and kind of begged me to represent them. And I've just said, look, I'll talk to you. I'll give you some advice, but this is not a case at this point in my career that I want to take. I mean, there's a, there's a difference. I mean, early on, you kind of are scrappy. You'll take almost anything. Um, As you get uh, on, and I've been doing this for over four decades, you're a little bit more discerning in what you think. Yeah. Yeah. But is that, is that most, is that mostly because you think the evidence is so overwhelming or does that really not matter to a criminal defense attorney? Is it more just about how you can get around the evidence? Well, let me tell you, there's, I won't mention any names again, but I will tell you that there's a current lawyer who is, who I know, who's a friend of mine, who's on a streak, um, a win streak. But the fact is, he's only taking cases to trial that he knows are weak from the prosecution standpoint. He's picking and choosing. I've had the opposite um, urge for whatever reason. And maybe you asked me about my childhood. Maybe it had something to do with that. But I like cases that look absolutely insurmountable. I like cases where somebody tells me you cannot win this case. To me, that is a much more challenging type of a case rather than padding my win streak. I've had incredible good fortune. Um, I remember a a seven-year pattern where, or a seven-year streak of cases where I hadn't lost a jury trial. But what that also does is it makes you a little, you know, you start to believe your own ego and think that you can never lose and kind of expand the horizons of what you will try. But I don't really care what the evidence is because that's not my role as a criminal defense lawyer. My role as a criminal defense lawyer, if the evidence is overwhelming, if I have tested it, if I've done a parallel investigation, if I believe that there's no way that you can win your case, then I've got another role. My role is find this person the best place for them to land. I often say, I'll get you a soft place to land, but um, that sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes clients are just in complete denial and do not want to hear what you have to say. So does it matter to you whether or not you think they're guilty? No, it doesn't. And I that's something I have to school clients on. I tell them, you know, there was, I'll tell you another story. I mean, I, out of college, gave serious thought to becoming a priest and following a professor of mine in college to theology or divinity school. And believe it or not, the archbishop talked me out of it and said, we need you more as a lawyer than as as another priest. And I will tell clients, I'm not your priest. I'm not a judge. I am somebody here to advocate for you. I'm here to fight for you. I'm a, to some degree, a mercenary, a legal mercenary within the confines of what is ethical. And by the way, you, 
you as a client, I don't know if you've ever, well, you've had, you've had your share of lawyers, I would assume, almost everybody has who's in, in a high profile position. You can't, you can't not have legal representation. The last thing you want as a client, I've been a client, the last thing you want is a lawyer who's judging you. You want yeah. a lawyer who has got your back. You want a lawyer who is defending you. You don't want a lawyer who's, I often joke about ex-U.S. attorneys. I say some of them have never left the office. They're still working for the prosecution. So mm -hmm. that's not what clients want. That's not what your role as a lawyer is. Your role as a lawyer is to serve your client. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. My schedule is always packed. I'm running from taping a podcast to a meeting to my daughter's school to maybe an event at night. And sometimes it's hard to make sure we get delicious, healthy meals. But with HelloFresh, you can choose from over 40 recipes every week to ensure creative, mouth-watering meals for you and your family. HelloFresh makes everything easier. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. They do all the shopping, portioning, prepping, and they even send step-by-step -step recipe cards with pictures so you can't even mess up if you try. To top it off, they have quick and easy options, including their 15-minute meals. That's less time than it takes to get delivery, so it's a no-brainer for us. So I've been using Green Chef in the past which is now owned by HelloFresh. And with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands and now with my listeners can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. HelloFresh is so great, my daughter even likes it. She invites friends over, they open the box, they make a meal, they look at the recipe card and they pretend that they're in a restaurant. It's adorable and I'm not kidding, the food is unbelievable. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 understood and use code 50 understood for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50 understood and use code 50 understood for 50% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Right. Um, okay. What is more powerful to you, the court of law or the court of public opinion? The reason why I want to bring that up is because of like the... Um, the Idaho murders, the Brian Koberger seems to be, is, am I pronouncing his name right? Yeah, Koberger. Okay. Um, he seems to be guilty in the eyes of everyone that's been following this trial, but he hasn't, or this case, but he hasn't gone to trial. The court of public opinion says he's guilty. So what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that is it's just a highly circumstantial case from what we know right now. By the way, the prosecution and to some degree, the defense has kept a pretty uh, a tight lid on this case. The judge has issued a gag orders. So everything that we're getting and having been there and dealt with what I call supersized murder trials, the you never know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. so there could be things here that the defense knows that could exculpate him. There could also be things that inculpate him that the prosecution knows and they want to wait until trial. I'll give you an example. If there is any DNA that connects any of those four, four unfortunate deceased to him in his apartment, that's a hard thing to explain. People will say, well, what about the DNA of the sheath and the knife at, at the location? That does not, as a defense lawyer, that does not answer the question for me that is that may be probable cause mm -hmm. you know is there a strong suspicion that's not uh, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt because anybody could have taken the sheath he could have handled it at any time and it could have been left there by the perpetrator could be for all we know the perpetrator is somebody he's interacting with so the court back long explanation back to your a question it is almost trite it's almost archaic if you're doing a high profile case to ignore the court of public opinion and mm -hmm. one of the reasons for that is if this case is going to trial and by all accounts it looks like it is it's going to be a trial you've got to select the 12 people who are going to decide this case if mm -hmm. they come in and they've already decided the case before they've entered those doors of that jury courtroom and that jury room then why are you even trying the case? You've got to you got to be there. You got to deal with it. You got to fight back. Yeah, I was going to ask you that later. What What are your thoughts on how do you create an unbiased jury, especially when there's a case 
that is so high profile like this and all the other ones we follow. True crime is what people are obsessed with now. So it's hard to not have details of a big case and already have formed an opinion. How do you select a jury uh, that is unbiased? One of the things that I've argued for the decades is that we have imported the tabloid culture from England, from the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we now have that here in America. However, in the UK, what happens? When you have one of these supersized cases, they have a mechanism for shutting down coverage once it gets to trial. We don't have that. We okay. actually have the opposite. We go wall-to-wall -wall coverage, take a look at some of the trials of the century, which seem to happen now every summer, um, but Murdoch being the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is always this kind of revelation, if you will, of evidence that takes place uh, during the trial and that we didn't know about beforehand, number one. And number two, you have people who are predisposed towards guilt because they assume there is this kind of assumption that if the prosecution brought the case, people want to reflexively believe there must be a case. How could they, how could they be wrong? Right. And all I always say is, you don't believe the government in every other um, context. Why do you believe the government here? But that's well, that, that's a good qu question and it comes to my next question, which is about having cameras in the courtroom. Um, a lot of people are against it. People are, you know, people are for it right now. Um, people are making a case to have cameras in the upcoming trial for Donald Trump. Um, I want to know your thoughts about that. But also, I know there was some issues with what you've said before, not having cameras in your Scott Peterson trial because they were only taking B-roll and catching glimpses of him. So everyone thought that he was cold or calculated or whatever their vision was. But sometimes it might be good to have um, cameras in the courtroom because of all this false news, or you're just getting the opinion of someone who's watching it. And then that journalist is giving the reflection of what they're seeing, which might not be accurate. You've hit it, the nail right on the head there. Um, my big complaint about, I thought Scott Peterson, I joined the prosecution and saying, no, I'm against cameras in the courtroom. I thought my thinking was that would dampen down the, the, the kind of, the uh, brouhaha and circus around it. it had the opposite effect i ended up having people sitting in new york three thousand miles away from uh, stanislaus uh, county three thousand miles away from san mateo who were commenting on what happened in the courtroom which bore little or no resemblance to what actually happened i've had this discussion with marcia clark i've known marcia since well before oj and uh, when she was a one of the hard charging rising stars in the LADA's office and couldn't lose the case, Marsha couldn't. And she and I, you know, she would say, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't want cameras in the courtroom, would be my mm -hmm. guess. And I've said, if I had to do it over again, I do want cameras in the courtroom. Or in the alternative, I would want jurors sequestered. And what I mean by that is you pick a jury and then the jurors they don't go home, they sit, they listen to the evidence, they go to a hotel, they come back uh, each day, listen to the evidence. A sequestered jury is probably the, the only alternative when you have these cases that are absolutely um, kind of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I do remember, however, one um, guy asking during jury selection in a case recently, if there was going to be a sequestered jury. And we said, no, the, I've asked for it, but the judge isn't giving it. And he says, oh, that's too bad. My wife was hoping that I would be sequestered. So <laughs> I never know what the people go in to jury service with different motivations. Is I sure. guess that's the way to put it. I, I do get that. Um, so uh, let's see how, uh, no, I asked that. Um, no, trials where you think they got it wrong. For me, that would be Casey Anthony. What do you think? No, I think Casey Anthony, based on the evidence, based on the evidence, based on the evidence that was in that was produced in court, I think Jose got the verdict uh, that he should have. That doesn't. You're right, you're absolutely right. He did an amazing job. He seemed like a genius. But so, ha ha and I was talking to a friend about this last night. 
it's so difficult because you have to, to be a good juror, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to go based on the evidence. Everyone may have known or thought she was guilty, but with what was presented to them, the jury did the right thing by finding her not guilty, correct? Well, it's exactly right. And I'll give you another example. There were two juries for OJ. There was a criminal jury with Marsha prosecuting, and there was a civil jury where Dan Petricelli was bringing the case on behalf of uh, the victims. The criminal jury acquitted OJ. And, you know, people who say that was an outrage. No, the based on the fact that you had the lead detective who was subsequently prosecuted for perjury, who the jurors saw committed basically or lied to them to their face. And you had beyond a reasonable doubt and OJ did not take the stand because I've had murder cases that I would have won if I, if my client didn't take the stand, I won't go there right now, but he, OJ did not take the stand. They acquitted the civil case where there's a different standard, Petricelli, Dan was able to call OJ to the stand, and that that and you had a lesser standard of proof, he was found liable. So both jur juries, in my opinion, got it right based on the confines of what the what the proof burden of proof is and what evidence was presented to them. So is there one you can think of where you think the jury got it wrong based on evidence? Well, I think that the case I was um talking about, which was uh, Zumat, which was a case that I tried over 10 years ago, murder case in Santa Clara County, was covered extensively by Dateline and some others. He, I, at the end of that, the prosecution case, there was no doubt in my mind that that jury was hung. Um, he later took the stand, and I think it's on the record over my objection, that jury ended up convicting him. Uh, jurors were interviewed uh, and said if he hadn't taken the stand, they never would have convicted him. The Court of Appeal and then the District Court, uh, District Court specifically, reversed that case. And it comes up for trial this next year. So, yes, I think the jury got it wrong. I don't think he was... Um, I don't think he was guilty by a long shot. But what happened is when you try a case... And the toughest decision a defense lawyer will ever have to make is, do I put my client on the stand? Because mm -hmm. what happens is everything that you've done before that, all the cross-examination, you can be the, uh, the incarnation of Clarence Darrow. Once you put your client on the stand, all the jurors talk about, first thing they're going to say when they go back there, what did the defendant say? Everything is, what is the accused? What did he say? What did he, did we like it? Did we want to, do we want to help him? Or did he look shifty? Did he, did he look like he was telling the truth or making up? Was it real tears? Yeah. Right. Exactly. And by the way, remember the disadvantage that a defendant has, especially if you're in custody. You're sitting there, you sleep in a cement box, you're eating bologna sandwiches, you're getting awakened at three in the morning to take a bus in shackles to go to court. Then your lawyer is yelling at you, put on some decent clothes so you don't look like a, a you know, a nerdy one. Uh, then you're going out there. You've got a prosecutor who's up there and he's slept in his bed. He's got a beautiful wife that, may, you know, that pushes him off in the morning or beautiful, or handsome husband who sends him on his way. And they're well rested. They have maybe had a nice dinner the night before. And you're doing that battle with that person while you're on trial for your life. It's a from the get go. It's an uneven battle. Yeah. Um, is there something just really quickly that you can spot when you're looking, when you're in a trial and you're looking at the jury, can you tell when they like a client, don't like a client, believe them, don't? Like, is there something you're looking for? You know, it's such a brilliant question. As we started off, you and I haven't met, but you you are so intuitive because the only reason that I'm still addicted to jury trials is precisely for that, Rachel B. There is nothing better in my mind than reading jurors or trying to read jurors or seeing what their reaction is to witnesses or to cl uh, closings or even openings, but to witnesses mostly. That is where um, I don't have very many skills, but cross-examination and reading jurors are the only two things I think I do well in life. And those are the things that keep me coming back uh, for more. I mean, it's addictive and it's it really 
it's the the urge. I understand people who are compulsive gamblers, for instance, mm -hmm. sitting at the table till they have no money at the table or till they can't push away. Yeah, there is something about a jury trial watching 12 strangers decide you're basically taking your client's life and putting it in 12 strangers' hands, and you get immediate kind of either validation as a lawyer and your client, obviously, but as a lawyer, the reason you keep doing it, but also one of the reasons that trial lawyers burn out at about 72. I've uh, This is one of my other anecdotal observations. They get to 72 and they fall off a cliff. And it, it, part of it is because you cannot keep up that kind of addiction to that adrenaline rush, in my humble opinion, for that long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of Alex Murdoff from earlier, um, there, his attorney is asking for a new trial. Just briefly, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think he'll get well, one? I, Do you think I've known, I've known Dick Harpootley and Jim, I know uh, because of this trial, but Dick Harpootley and I've known for many, many years. So he's a wonderful lawyer. I think he's got a whale of an issue here. The idea, remember, we were just, you're, you're great at this, Rachel. The, the, um, Hardest decision you have to make is whether you put your client on the stand. I know, I will tell you how, that they struggled with that decision mm -hmm. because the evidence, in my opinion, had been less than what you needed for beyond a reasonable doubt until they put him on the stand. But they made the decision to do that. That's ultimately it's the one area where the client has control. You can tell the client, like I, I, I have on, on several occasions, I don't want you to testify. They get the ultimate. It's not strategic. At that point, it's the client's constitutional right. So Murdoch takes the stand. They did not know that the court clerk had allegedly gone in and told the jurors, don't believe him, watch him, watch his body language, basically had torpedoed that decision, the most important decision you'll make in a trial before they'd ever called him to the stand. So is that material? Absolutely. Is that something that it should get reversed? Unfortunately for the taxpayers, yes. Wow. That will be interesting. Um, okay, let's get to the Menendez brothers, which is why I really wanted to talk to you. And I'm out of time. So <laughs> not uh, yet. I got five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so um, all right. So Basically, everyone knows the story. I'm not going to recap it. The bottom line is that um, Lyle and Eric have been um, in jail for about 34 years now. They were convicted, um, life in prison for the both of them. Um, and now there is some new evidence. You have submitted a writ of habeas corpus. Um, and also, I think there's um, a California resentencing law, and you are looking to do some um, mitigation evidence. Just tell us what all that means. Sure. So... For those who weren't in the weeds at the time, you did a, a wonderful job of kind of summarizing it. But basically what happened is trial number one, the kind of renowned defense lawyer Leslie Abramson tried. It became it was a hung jury. More jurors leaning towards manslaughter than murder. Uh, that's what a hung jury is. Mm -hmm. After that trial, what happens? Gil Garcetti is running for DA. Uh, they lose the OJ case. And they're mocked because they had also lost the case involving the four officers and Rodney King. There was this perception that the LADA's office could not win the big one. So they assigned, miraculously, David Kahn to try the second case. David Kahn was believed to be the chief rival for Gil Garcetti politically in the uh, next election. So David was taken off the board, was not going to run against Gill. They then tried the second trial, and the judge changed all of his rulings, did not allow in what's called imperfect self-defense, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we have a robust theory here in California about battered women's syndrome, which had been expanded into other traumas, and that would have been imperfect self-defense. Basically pulled the rug out from under them, at the last hour, and then allowed, after excluding all evidence of abuse, the judge then allowed the, the DA to argue that they had not provided any evidence, and it was an abuse excuse, and these kids were just spoiled brats, after knowing that he had successfully excluded all of that evidence. 
Mm -hmm. Fast forward to sometime in 2018, 2019, a documentarian, Robert Rand, found a letter that had been written by Eric to his cousin, who's now passed away. And the letter prior, eight months or nine months prior to the homicides, had been complaining about the abuse at the hands of his father. Then the documentary comes out where there is evidence that one of the uh, boys in the then boy in the Benuto band had also been raped by Jose Menendez. You combine those two together, we're arguing that that's reason enough for a new trial, number one. And number two, there is, as you mentioned also, somebody's doing your homework, maybe it's you, uh, that there is a, it's you, uh, that there's a resentencing glitch here in the law where they are eligible to be resentenced. So we're moving, we're walking and chewing gum at the same time, going down two tracks. Okay, so just quickly, I interviewed a guy named Daniel Viegas, who also they submitted a writ of habeas corpus. He was able to get a new trial. He was offered an Alfred plea. Do Alfred pleas come in here or it doesn't work with somebody who's already, they are guilty of killing their parents. It's just if they're uh, manslaughter or not. Right. An Alfred plea is the federal equivalent of what we have in California, which is called a people versus West plea. That's a no contest plea. You okay. could do that if they offered it uh, there. They have never argued that they didn't do it. They've always argued the mental state and the mental okay. state is what separates murder from a manslaughter. And okay. the majority of jurors, there were two juries in the first case, one for Lyle, one for Eric. The majority of the jurors voted not guilty on murder, meaning they didn't believe the mental state was there. So yes, there could be an Alfred slash people versus West resolution here, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. So just quickly, how are you managing they their moods in jail right now? How do they think they're going to do? Well, I don't want to reveal attorney client. You wouldn't want me to do that. So I will just <laughs> say that they're, I'm putting together mitigation packages, which will go to the DA, and both of them have done impressive work while knowing for over 30 years or maybe 20 years that they had no chance of getting out. So I think right. that speaks volumes to the um, idea that they have um, are, are perfect candidates. Okay. All right. Well, I know we're out of time here, so I will ask that maybe once this moves forward and there's more information on it, you would come back. Two last questions, super quick. What case are you the most proud of in your history? That's tough. There's a there's a bunch of them. The, the case I alluded to where the young man was charged with special circumstance murder, and I ended up getting that dismissed, and then I sued and was able to get him a multi-million dollar settlement. That is one. Susan McDougall, I always um, say it changed the course of my career. Susan was the business partner of Bill Clinton, and I defended her during the Whitewater investigation against the independent counsel, and she was acquitted of obstruction of justice in Arkansas and was acquitted in Santa Monica here of all counts. That's also one that I'm, I'm proud of. Okay. And who is your most misunderstood client? That's tough. Um, Michael Jackson and to some degree, uh, Chris Brown. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at there. I'll, okay, I love those I'll, answers. I'll do a, dry, a mic drum. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, Mark, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.